So that means the back side of the drywall is facing yeah. up. And then I can just kind of... You're going to back butter it. I'm a back butter it. <laughs> and then I lift it up. Not, not get the right adhesive. <laughs> no. We're going to figure this out. Oh, yeah. well, We're going to keep going down this road for a while. <laughs> well, because I, I already had it in the gun. <laughs> Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast. It's our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. Uh, I, we have Rob Yeagan and Brian Pontalillo, and I'll be your host, Justin Fink. I'm, I'm laughing because last night I was sitting at the bar with, with Aaron, who you guys posted a picture of while I was gone. Uh, not a sister. Not a sister. Not uh, a relative. And, and I, was, I was joking about how we are going to do the podcast, and I was like, <laughs> like look, at, look at Brian's <laughs> face. <laughs> Brian's Wait a minute. Face. That's what I said, he just, right? Like, couldn't be a, I said it couldn't be a sister or a relative. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. Yes. Um, <laughs> Nailed it. Uh, <laughs> I'm like a forensic... Something. Something that has to do with having friends help you build a house. Yeah. yeah. She actually is in, she's actually involved in the world of building. She works for a Connecticut Trust for Historic Preservation, so she's an old house lover. But I, I she listens to the podcast, and we were joking last night. I was like, I got the podcast in the morning, got to gotta, gotta get some prep work done. And and, and she's like, you know, she's like, I'll do, the, I'll do the podcast. I'm like, all right, let me hear your intro. And the first thing ever, she goes, she goes, welcome to the, what did she say? Welcome to the the Hein Foam Building podcast. Oof. I was like, "Nap, you're off." Yep. Oh, yeah. oh, she wants to host. I don't know. That's we'll, funny. We'll have her on as a guest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk about how to she get does a grant work with going. The, she works with a guy that she yeah. refers to as the house doctor. Oh, so get him on. The, as a he's guest. an old house expert. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. Um. So. <laughs> Sorry, we'll move on, Rob. Sorry. All right, let's move it along, guys. We're always in a rush. Uh, let me remind you of our email address, fhbpodcast at taunton.com, where you can send us your questions and topics for discussion. You can uh, listen to the podcast through any of your favorite podcast outlets. You can also check us out, watch the video of us yammering on the website or on YouTube, and make sure to send us some feedback, either a iTunes review or comments below, or shoot us a note. Um, we're always looking for new things to talk about. Uh, let's see here. We've got a bunch of feedback topics that I thought we would go through. We got a couple of questions that we'll get to. I won't tease the topics because I don't know how many that we'll get to, so you'll just have to wait. Um, but let's let's jump into some stuff, one of which uh, is from Troy, but give me a second. Let me do Ben first. Ben writes, hey, gents, I'm a relatively new member to FHB and have been cruising through your podcast over the past three weeks, and I've nearly caught up. Just finished episode 61 with your conversation with Jeremy Martin and found his method of project cost schedule scoping awesome. It really hit home with me as I'm a civil engineer working for a consulting firm, and we handle the design, cost estimating, and construction coordination efforts in a very similar fashion, regardless of project scale, from $10,000 to nearly $1 billion. I believe it's fair to say that for anyone building anything, the two most important items to know for the owner and builder are cost and schedule. Mm. Having a tool on paper, like spreadsheets, specs, contract, or anything like that, that identifies what is and what is not included in the anticipated work is very handy. I believe the quality of a project in many cases is highly dependent on the paper that precedes it, and that having the designer, builder, and owner in the game together earlier rather than later certainly lends, lends to success. Leads to success? Or dramatic heartbreak for some HGTV watchers. Keep up the good work. P.S. It would be great if you could do another podcast on how to build a, quote, good home for a reasonable price, say, less than 200 k not including cost of land. I, I, does he want us to just do the same topic again? That was a great episode. When yeah, we did that, that. that was fun. I wonder if we could spin it a different way, though. Like, what what way? So the episode he's talking about, I think it was the three of us, wasn't it? Yeah. We were talking about um, the proposed budget of two hundred thousand yeah. dollars to build a house. What would you, what would your house look like? I wonder if there's another another spinoff of that we could do with a slightly different tangent. Don't we have a, and that's not a, it's not an uncommon question. And I think we have another one in the queue somewhere very similar. I wonder if we could do a remodel. You could do a remodel or, you know, what else might, we could even get some people on here to put, you know, share some, sure, some there, thoughts on that. That could be the recurring know? theme. Back in the early days of the podcast, we used to do, if you had to build a house tomorrow, what assembly would you what have would in this you spot? Do? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, that does change weekly for us. So it's, some people are like, yeah, why would that, why would that be a subject? Because for us, it's weekly. It changes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Um, anything well, to, one of the things, you know, well, that... What are you, what are you talking about with the topic in the queue, though? Before I think we have another... Uh, another I, question. I remember seeing another question of, around. We have another question around somewhere just like that. Someone was... Oh, yeah? Yeah, yeah. wanting to he wanted get to build, our, He wanted to build a high-performance home, and right. he wanted to know, like, where he should allocate that budget. Oh, I remember seeing yeah. that now. Yeah. We get, we, get, we get to do that with, through that filter. Yeah. Yeah, he had... Um, I could pull it up right now if you want to talk about it, but I'm not prepared for it. Well, uh, I just wanted to point that I, I wanted to nah, point. Uh, nah, nah, future show. <laughs> I wanted to point out that part of that. the answer, I think, is in his feedback. Um, and this is something I was just on a trip visiting a house, um, architect designed home in um, Colorado that's going to be in the houses issue. And one of the things the homeowner, this is, the homeowner has worked with this architect before and they've actually had, they had their previous house in the magazine. And he was talk. He was reflecting on that process of building the first house, and how when they started, they bought the land, and they started the process. They thought they thought we have to just find some in affordable, inexpensive plans and give them to a builder. They thought that was the way they were going to save money, mm -hmm. and so they started that process of looking for plans and, and interviewing builders, showing the builders plans, and and getting these quotes. And somehow things they they just weren't getting to the number that they needed to get to to be able to build on this property. And he said it wasn't until he hired a, an architect that he got to that number. And it wasn't until the architect brought the builder on board. So pointing right back at what he says, um, you know, wherever it was in that sentence, that getting all these people involved early on oh, totally. is so important. So not only so important to the success of the schedule, but important to the success of the budget and getting to, you know, having everyone that might be involved putting their input towards that budget yeah. and how to minimize that budget and then get, getting them to buy into meeting and maintaining that so budget. So you're saying by starting with a cookie cutter floor plan from a, one of these warehouses of floor plans isn't necessarily going to save you money. Yes, you won't pay for an architect, but you don't have – you're not starting from the point of – planning things to be as efficiently priced as cost yeah. as possible I mean, the plans aren't optimized yeah and, yeah, and, and the builder is just going to look at the plans and give his per square foot price based right. on your level of finish yeah, yeah. um everything else becomes an add-on mm -hmm. so a budget needs to be integral to design it needs mm -hmm. to be integrated from the get-go that's funny we that's a reoccurring theme that we've talked about in the past but like the best projects that we see um Every one of them always, you know, every homeowner or architect reflects on that collaborative process early on. But I've always interpreted it as like, oh, that's how you get to this level of execution. Mm -hmm. But yeah, to manage that budget. Um, and it, it, it speaks to the high performance thing. And I, we've, we've had some people tell us about this too. Some architects and builders talk about this process about how like, you know, high performance homes get in the mainstream building world, they get this rap as being very expensive because in the mainstream building world, they're all their features, their upgrades. Mm -hmm. So here's what your house costs. And now you want to do this. Oh, this is the upgrade. This is the upgrade. This is the upgrade. And uh, we've had a lot of, um, uh, designers and, and, um, um, like green building consultants and whatnot, energy efficiency guys tell us that if you, if you start with that stuff as integral to the design, you actually find ways to save money through the process. Yeah. Um, so two different sort of ways of looking at it that always end up the, the integrated approach is always going to end up yeah. more cost effective. Mm. Yeah. If I were to build a house, I would never like try to go it alone. You know, it's about getting that team in place no matter what I think. Yeah. Oh, I'd be so tempted to go it alone. Uh, so would I. Yeah, oh, yeah. Totally. I'd blow it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd probably try and build the whole thing myself. Yeah, I, you sketch it out on a napkin at the bar. We were just talking. <laughs> well, sure. And then, and then you start building the next day. Yeah, hind, hind foam building. <laughs> hind foam building. Um, Rob and I were just talking this morning because recently I posted a video of myself working on the my porch. Yes. I did an article about the porch trim. I made a little video of myself working solo that was in sort of response to that conversation we had here about whether it makes any sense to work solo. Mm -hmm. A lot of people responded to that video and it seemed to be really popular and hit some kind of a, struck a chord with people. Yeah. So this morning I was flipping through issue one of the magazine because I was really, I don't know, it came up in conversation yesterday and I pulled it off the shelf because I wanted to get a look at like what the tone of the magazine was in 1981. Like how, what was our, what was our level of depth and what kind of topics we're covering? It's just part of this conversation we were having. But uh, I found an article in there in issue one about raising a uh, 
was it? I think it was called Sol- solo barn raising or solo timber framing mm. or something. And it was this guy who admitted in the lead of the article, you know, that he really he's always dreamt about making a timber frame garage or outbuilding of some kind, and uh, because he could work on it slowly and he liked that and kind of take his time with it, which is really cool. Um, but that you needed, you know, he, I think he said a couple of dozen people to really erect it. And he said, which I don't have. So he started to think about how can I do this with my tractor and a bunch of right. ingenuity and can I change up the order and can I preassemble these things? And so the article was a series of illustrations that showed how he tackled raising a barn by himself with a tractor. But he also said you could do it with a Jeep or something else with it, like a, uh, oh, an electric winch. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so, um, I have no idea why I started talking about this. I completely lost my train of thought. I don't know, but we actually talked about this when you weren't here. Working solo? This topic, yeah, because I felt like I agree with you that we got some – We that video prompted some pretty interesting discussion, and it was really interesting to see how how people – you know, there wasn't a debate on quality of work so much as it was on production. Um, and I just noticed and found it interesting that where, where some people did feel like, you know, working alone, I get it done. And other people felt like another person – I think this is the comment that I found most interesting – said another person doesn't add – you know, one more person's effort, it adds one and a half more person's yeah. productivity to my job site. And I hadn't thought about it that way. Um, but I, I felt like it was just a, a dynamite discussion. And I think a, on our on a bunch of our, it's probably buried a little bit now, but on, a, on our social media, Facebook and maybe Instagram is where I saw these happening. So people are interested in chiming in. So so this kind of falls into the, the general contractor more of a mindset. Well, I was on vacation. Or no, this is after vacation. It was last weekend. Uh, I was still continuing to work on my garage, work on the electrical. And uh, we had pulled, my dad had come down and helped, and we'd pull all the wire through. My mom even helped. It was great. I got a photo of the three of us working. I'll have to dig awesome. that up. Um, and, uh, but then I still had a bunch of finished work to do. I had a lot of outlets to put in. I had to make the main connection from the sub panel in the garage to the house. And my dad is always offering to help. So I originally said, nah, I don't think I have enough work to, to really make it worth your drive down here, which is almost two hours. Uh, and I feel bad. I, I'm not good at asking for help. And then when I don't feel like I have enough to justify it, then I really. But so anyway, like the then the the morning of, I woke up and I was like, well, there's probably enough here that I could use some help. And I'm just being stupid about this. So I called him up and he was like, yeah, actually, no, I got nothing going on today. And I said, all right, come down. So he and my mom come down, and my mom doesn't want want to work on electrical. She worked on it that one day and determined that it was boring. Uh, she's happier doing gardening and that kind of stuff. So I set her to work, right? She's clearing this area over in the front and she's moving stuff around the yard. And, and my dad's in there and he's, he's, uh, hooking up, uh, receptacles and he's, he's working in the main panel down in the basement and he's, he's running the, the number six cable across the ceiling. And I quickly discovered like probably a little after lunch that I was getting zero done because my entire day was just being spent answering their questions mm-hmm. and like lending a hand, like, Hey, I need a third hand here real quick. Can you just hold this up while I put a cable staple in or, Hey, Justin, can you move the wheelbarrow for me? Um, so you, hey, you hey, be, so you became kind of like the, the assistant or like I the, was the assistant and, and I got Not nothing, the lead and I got nothing done all day. So That's it sort of made me, I didn't realize it until my mom said to me, uh, you know, she was like, I'm sorry, I keep interrupting you. And I was like, Yes, this is what it feels like at the office, too. I can't work on articles anymore. I just walk around and answer questions all day. Mm-hmm. And it's such a shift for me from being the guy out in the field. But it's the same. So, so I started to, to kind of go, well, how much could I have gotten done if I was by myself? And how much did I get done by having three people? I got more done with three people, but I didn't really do as much. Yeah. So it was like it was that kind of a struggle. And I think some of the working alone thing is that maybe you're slower, but you get to still do the part you like. Mm. Does that make sense? Sure. There's also something interesting about like a, a dynamic that I think is important on any site, whether it's like, you know, knocking around your place with, you know, a group of friends or family on the weekends or actually we're going to cruise. Like someone needs to be the lead. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Of course. And you, you yeah. can't just have that kind of like democratic, you know, conversation right. over every little thing. So right. it is like, like just like at work, you know, like if you're in a management position, it's like you're keeping, keeping the flow happening. You and, know what well, I mean? Well, that becomes your job. And if yeah. you're gonna, if you're gonna have, if you're gonna work by your, if you want to work by yourself, 
then that's the kind of work you're going to do stuff that you can handle by yourself and you're yeah. and that's how much money you're going to make right yep. and you and if you if that's the way you want to work and you like working like that and you can make a living great mm -hmm. and but you might decide at some point you want to make more money or you want to take different types of jobs and if you want to have crews or increase your volume you, of jobs or increase know, your volume basis, of jobs yeah. yeah if you want to have crews you have to become the manager yeah well I've got, but the other thing too is that obviously Working with my parents, we're not a well-oiled machine. Of course, you know. Right. So if you're doing the same kind of work over and over, you're not going to have to have as many conversations. Yeah. If if you have the right employees that are well, uh, are self-starters. I was talking to our ambassador Aaron Aaron Butt yesterday, um, and I I was talking to him about that about working with someone you know who is totally on your level, and he was reflecting um, uh, on a recent job or a job in the past where he's working with a buddy who is totally on his level, and he's like, it was the best project. He's like, we wouldn't talk all day long. Oh yeah. I've been on those. You know what I mean? It's unbelievable. And he's like, you're just, you know, the guy's always there with whatever that next step is, or yeah. he knows what you're thinking. He's anticipating everything that you're doing. You don't need to communicate in like the normal fashion. You know, you just it's yeah. one of the best listen feelings. to music and you're just cruising, you yeah. know, feeding off each other's energy. We call it yeah. flow. You're in the, but you're yeah. in the you zone. Know, you're right about that. You mentioned, <clears> you said you felt like the assistant and I mean, I remember being a foreman on a landscape construction crew and like, yeah, you're the leader in, in terms of like, we're going to do this first. You're going to do this. You're going to do that. But then for the rest of the day, you're the assistant. And, and I was just visiting that builder in Colorado. And what was he doing when I met him? He was showing up on the job site to bring a couple of two by fours to his yeah. crew. He was assisting them. That was so, uh, when yeah. I was on site, you know? when I was on a project earlier this week, the project manager, um, you know, when I first met him, he was kind of just doing some, you know, he was set up in the garage, his little kind of command. It was a huge remodel on the coast um, up in uh, Massachusetts. But yeah, he was doing work. And then the next thing I see, he's bringing work lights, brand new work lights yeah. to his guy who I had overheard before saying, I need more light in here. Yeah. So he's the gopher running to like, yeah. you know, whatever to get him light. Yeah. So it is. He, but he's the guy in, in charge of that whole project. Yeah. You know, but he's the support role. Yeah. You know. Makes yeah. me think of Michael Scott's book, Somehow I Manage. What is that? Michael Scott from The Office. <laughs> from the office. He had a book on the show. <laughs> he always, if there, Somehow I that, Manage. Throughout that show, he always, every once in a while he mentions the book that he's planning on writing. And it's called Somehow I Manage. It's a book on management. <laughs> Oh, uh, well, anyways, funny. if everyone wants to see that uh, solo timber framing article, we'll Michael throw the link up to that blog and that that article. Um, and I encourage anybody that that isn't already checking out our our digital archive to definitely go on to finehomebuilding dot com and look yeah. for that. What uh, is is pretty? It's, it's a pretty. It's really if you're into this kind of stuff, it's yeah. actually pretty entertaining because you go back to every issue of fine home building well and yeah. to see the articles that we were publishing in the 80s and to see the work that was being done it's just cool well you know? so, so what i was writing in the, i wrote, just wrote this blog today and posted it about that article and and i was kind of referencing our, the conversation rob and i had this morning he was you know he was flipping through i was talking to him about this he was flipping through on my desk and he's like yeah look at these old articles look at the old tile job here and stuff but then there's like but there's stuff in there that's really useful still because um, like, for instance, that issue one in 1981, there was an article about drain waste fence systems and the parts were antiquated because you're not putting in cast iron stacks and that kind of stuff anymore. But, oh, my God, it would be so useful if you had a house from the 50s, 60s, 70s, oh, yeah. 80s, and you just wanted to know yeah. how, it was done. how I'm going to, like, tie into this thing. It's like this is how you would – it's like it's almost like a look back. At, it's like a, a, a an archived manual. And there's an awesome stair article in there. Oh, it's killer. It is so cool with dovetailed um, balusters. Uh, you know that like – Yeah, they slide they in from yeah. the end of the tread so and sliding they get covered dovetail. with the, with the, the oh, tread wow. return. Super cool. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's real cool. Um, geeking, geeking out a little bit on our own content. <laughs> well, you get all those – what is that? 270 issues worth of stuff if you sign up. It's pretty yeah. cool. Anyway, we don't spend enough time pulling that stuff up and we got to start. We will. Um, so Troy, remember how the other, the other day in a recent episode, we mentioned how Troy hasn't written to us in a while. Right before we said that, he wrote me a note and said, Hey, I felt, I haven't checked in in a while. I thought I'd, um, but he said, uh, I thought I'd follow up with you on the beach house siding project as I basically followed your advice to the letter. I'm happy to say it's gone really well. The biggest pain was pulling this. So this is as got a, it. As a, <laughs> we got it, guys. Nailed nice it. job. As a recap, I, I think the thrust of this whole question was that he had T111. Yeah. And what was it? He was trying to figure out whether to rip it off and put on house wrap over the studs or whether to just side right over it. Yeah, I think that was the, uh, the gist of it. And he said the biggest pain was pulling the T111 off the house before moving forward, and I'm glad I did. Your discussion of it was the tipping point that made me go ahead and remove it. 
Um, under the T111, there was a layer of sheathing comprised of various materials that had been applied over time. Some areas had old growth shiplap, some had plywood, and a lot of areas had OSB. So basically it was a, a total <laughs> S show. Um, there was a WRB kind of made of number 15 felt in some areas and Tyvek in others. By the way, I like that the choice is number 15 instead of 15 pound. He is correct. People say 15 really? pound felt. Yeah, it's not 15 well, pound. Where did that come from? Well, because I think it used to be. Whatever the fifteen pound and thirty pound, but then when it stopped being that, they switched the number sign to the beginning. Yeah, a little tidbit for you. I'm guessing it must be what the what the whole roll weighed, not. That's interesting because I still would I would have read that fifteen pound felt. Yeah, we write it this way in the magazine. Yeah, that's... or at least I always change it to that. Yeah. Um, right. Anyway, he said he goes on to say this is probably the case on a lot of older homes that have been repaired. You know, the, the fact that there's a million different WRBs. Mm -hmm. Here was the killer. The WRB was not detailed correctly at any of the windows, doors, or corners. Of course, the caulking didn't hold back the water, so it got in there and stayed there for a long time. Shiplap was still in great condition. The plywood had a little rot at some edges, and the OSB was a moldy mess that fell apart as I removed, removed it. The exterior T111 was basically okay, and the OSB behind a poor WRB was a nightmare. So let's just sit here and, and put a very fine point on this he was gonna not take off this t111 he was gonna just yeah take the easy path put a wrb over the t111 or not and then install new siding and paint it but look at when he pulled off the t111 all the stuff that he found that he was about to be burying in his house it's easy to just kind of walk away from this stuff but it can be a real nightmare if you don't if you don't dig in and see what you got in there yeah i i, I find this part of this of his feedback so interesting too just just reflecting on the three different materials and how they held up to the water right. in uh -huh. the way that like yeah you know we could say like you know the properly detailed weather barrier like that's not gonna be a problem but hey well we say all the time the water gets behind things it yep. gets in places and and you know osb gets bashed by a lot of old school builders who just say you know no way not on my projects and i always kind of like feel a little bit resistant to those comments like mm -hmm. well you're gonna you know you're gonna probably flash things and so you know the osb is just fine but you know this is a so this is a good example of what happens when it does get wet and also just, be mindful of like the context like this is right on the ocean from this what is, i recall right. so it, it can work if you do it if you detail it right but it doesn't have it has a glass jaw that's the phrase we always come back to is i remember do you remember that basement project i worked on next town over here and you came over yeah. and you did some drywall we with me. With the drywall, yeah. So when it came time to insulate the rim joist there, I think this is what we were doing, um, pulled back some bat insulation around the rim joist at the top of the foundation wall, and the sheathing was was just like, it was like a thin cracker <laughs> of OSB <laughs> at that point. And, and I went, whoa, this is no good, told the homeowner. So as part of the job, he just had me kind of patch in that sheathing we went around and, and it was um it turned out to be under the deck and the under the back deck is where this area was and what happened was they had a sliding door let's call it like six feet wide and the house wrap stopped you know the there was house wrap on the whole house it was vinyl siding but there was no house wrap directly under the door hmm. so i don't know whether somebody just didn't put a piece there or if they cut it out for the door and then took the bottom off with it so it ended up being <clears throat> The, the trouble with it is that it extended up behind the deck ledger. And so it was the whole six foot width below the door and then maybe, I don't know, three or four feet tall because it was the deck ledger and then a little bit of space below it. And it was just obliterated, mm -hmm. like gone. And that was, a, that was a nightmare to fix. Yeah. Like one simple little thing. You forgot that little piece of house wrap under there and it was a massive amount of work to fix that. Uh so OSB does not – it does not stand not like up water. if you don't co <laughs> if you don't cover it. It does not do well. But anyway. I just – that – talking about that project made me think of that homeowner. Oh, God. He was he, so worried. He, well, that's not even what I thought was funny. I mean because I didn't have to deal with him. But I do remember that he pretty much chased you around with a can of spray foam. <laughs> 
<laughs> and just like he was, he must have gotten in his head somewhere that you got to seal everything. And he was just the days that I was there, he was down there with spray foam, just, just going nuts, sealing stuff. <laughs> yeah, I remember this one area. He tried to fill. He tried to fill one of those giant cavities, and it's just like it all. He sprayed it all in, and it just kind of like Weeped sagged <laughs> and made this big mess <laughs> down at the bottom. By the way, uh, when I was working on the garage, I didn't forgot to tell you guys this. I was I had my first go around with um, spray foam adhesive for the drywall. Oh uh, yeah. And I tried first. I tried like for the corner bead. No, no, no. For hanging the sheets. Oh, 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 oh sorry. Okay. So it goes into the regular spray foam gun, but it's an adhesive. Oh yeah, yeah. And so this one, the I had a can loaded up that was the Advantec stuff, which is not made for, for this. subfloor. It's made for putting down subfloor. But I was like, well, maybe it'll be the same thing. Let me just try it. Of course he did. Of course. So I sprayed it up onto the the ceiling joist, quickly realized that it has no ability to stay up there, mm-hmm. and it just, like, drips down. And that was, you can imagine the nightmare of that, yeah. of polyurethane dripping overhead to your face. while you're trying to hang oh. drywall. So then I thought, <laughs> all right, I'm going to... I'm going to apply it. I'm going to put the sheet of drywall up on the drywall lift. So that means the back side of the drywall is facing up. Yeah. And then I can just kind of. You're going to back butter it. I'm a back butter it. <laughs> and then I lift it up. Not not get the right <laughs> adhesive. No. <laughs> We're going to figure this out. Oh, yeah. Well, We're wait a second. We're going to keep going down this road for a while. <laughs> well, because I, I already had it in the gun. Of course. <laughs> so, but wait, though. You're going you're gonna to bite your tongue because then I got the right adhesive. And yeah. it was drywall adhesive. It was Titan brand which the guys at Drywall Nation use all the time, and I tried to spray that up there. I still I can't get it to look – I can't get it as easily done as, as they're doing it Like because I find like you spray it up on the joist and it doesn't stick. Like it doesn't – so mm-hmm. there's a there's like the perfect um, – seems to be the perfect amount of – I don't know what the distance is or the amount of spray foam where you want to hit it hard enough that it sticks and doesn't just kind of like bounce off. Right. But not add so much that it's going to – exceed its own ability to hold on and then peel off too like it might stick for a second and then fall so it was i I ended up putting it on the back of the drywall regardless of the adhesive i was using which was just easier for me but i haven't you know i'd always used the the caulk gun drywall adhesive and that seemed pretty easy to me like you would just kind of press the tip against the framing and pull the trigger and work your way down and it stuck uh, but this stuff, I was having trouble getting to stick. So, but I know that I've seen videos of other people using it with success. So I, I just wanted to offer my, I thought the learning curve would be easy and I was having trouble making it work for me. So how was like the tackiness? Like, I, so then you would just crank that sheet up, push it into place yep. and it would, yeah. you throw just less screws in it. Yeah, or, pretty much. <clears throat> thing is though you still need the same amount of screws to hold a sheet in place. Like, yeah, you like put if, it you're in gonna, the field and... if you're going to pull the drywall lift down you need to have screws in it. It's right. not like I'm going to put one screw in the middle and I'm done because <laughs> right. the glue's doing the work, you know, yeah. you just, um, but I don't know. We'll see if it c- controls nail pops better. I would assume it would. And when I say nail pops, I mean screws because I didn't use nails. Yeah. Should use nails. Kick, yeah. it, kick it old school. It's, yes. it's surprising to me that nobody's come up with a system like, like, you know, how they have scrails for decking screw nails. So you shoot them in with a pneumatic but gun, but then you can them back out. them out like a screw. If you need to replace them or something. Why are we still driving screws into drywall? I don't know. Like, can't somebody come up with a staple or something that you just, like, boom, 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 move to the next sheet? Especially yeah, if we're I using mean, an adhesive? I feel like when you watch a good drywall crew work, it almost feels like they're moving that fast. Yeah, I know. Mm. What about the rest of us? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, back to back to Troy. <clears throat> so he got the T111 off and replaced and et cetera. Uh, after that, goat rodeo, my new favorite term, <laughs> I put in new windows, a door and trim, flashing everything correctly. I applied two layers, number 30 felt, which was the city building inspector's suggestion, rain screen mesh, then the shingles. The rain screen is made by Keen, which I've seen before, and is a quarter inch thick is a quarter inch thick under compression of the shingles. Okay, so it compresses to quarter inch thick. Mm-hmm. I hand nailed the front of the house in a couple of courses, after a couple of courses, you learn how to compensate for the bounce from the mesh. I broke, I broke down and bought a coil nailer for the rest. Um, anyway, he said uh, he just wanted to let us know that the advice was was spot on. Um, but we do have some photos of the project, which um, looks great. We have up behind us here on the on the uh, television and also on finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. It looks awesome, Troy. So it looks like like little. Like a little gingerbread house or something, like a little dollhouse. Yeah, that that steep gable yeah, that's entryway. Quite the sweet. pitch. Yeah. yeah, yeah. 
Um, all right, moving on to Pearl. Pearl writes, hi, guys. Love your podcast. It's a regular on all of our road trips. So fun to hear you guys hash things out. Last year, from September on, we were running parallel on our house project up near Wakefield, Quebec, Canada, with what you featured each week. A suggestion for all construction that maybe you guys could help signal boost. Through our project, we called the cripples a pony, as in a small stud. Keep up the good work. I just thought it was funny that um, she mentions pony studs. That was their, that was their kind of joking name for it. But that's actually a, I mean, a pony wall. Yeah, is a pony thing. wall. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, I w- before I brought this up, I just went quickly and searched for it on Google to see if, uh, you know, to <laughs> to ensure that I wasn't making up the term. Um, and it turns out that it actually refers to several different short walls. Um, and I thought this was kind of cool. The term comes from 1863. Walter Clydell of Lehigh, Nebraska, created a short-walled stable for his horses. Soon after, as the wall gained popularity amongst his fellow farmers, the public began to refer to this specific wall height as a pony wall. Um, And in different circumstances, it might refer to a a half wall that only extends partway from floor to ceiling, which is a half wall. That's what Mm -hmm. I'd always consider a pony wall. Um, But it can also be a stem wall, like a short concrete wall, um, or a cripple wall, which is the framing above a half concrete wall. Um, so it's essentially yeah. a short wall, but it also reminds me that Colin, our video guy, <laughs> calls them hip walls because they come to about hip height. Yeah, and he that's right. He, he can't seem to get it out of his his uh, his I lexicon. Yeah. So thank you, for Pearl, for the note. All right. You want to, y'all want to do some questions? Oh, wait, I saw, sorry, I saw one more feedback. Yeah, we're, we're, we're blasting through these. Chris writes, and this is, this is interesting timing because of the, all the hurricanes we've been experiencing lately. Enjoyed your recent podcast discussion of ICFs. The answer to one of the benefits of ICF homes just hit Texas. I live on the Florida Gulf Coast, and I can tell you the people have built ICF or CMU houses sleep well when a storm comes. I have framed many stick-framed houses and can tell you from experience that mechanical connectors in wood frame houses help dramatically, but are sometimes no match for storm surge. When a Volvo floats into a house, it will do some damage and a floating refrigerator will tear up the inside of a home. I do enjoy the podcast and keep craft alive for an old guy like me that learned a lot from FHB from the likes of Tom Law, Scott McBride, and Larry Hahn. It's nice to know we aren't a dying breed. There are young people in the trades that care and will carry on. That's for sure. Keep craft alive. Um, um, that's an interesting Yeah, it's a interesting feedback. Um, Scott Gibson, one of our freelance guys, just sent me a story of a house that is built completely out of concrete. You know how we were talking about that? Yeah. It's a passive house and it's fully concrete, like every component of it. The walls, the roof, the I mean it the window cut like it's just a con it yeah. looks really bizarre when it's still being built, I think. Um it has an insane budget too, but it's it's cool looking. I'll have to I'll dig up the picture and send it to Mike so he can put it up there and you can check it out. Um, I, we, we passed on talking about it in the magazine cause it's just too expensive and sort of, well, who the heck's going to do this? But I wonder how those, uh, all concrete houses or houses built with ICFs, how they, how they withstand the storm surge. You know what I mean? I can understand like flying debris, things like that. But when there's like flooding happening, there's strategies to, to prevent that. It's probably not going to float. I don't think it's going to float. Yeah. But I think the water's still going to get in there and tear tear some stuff up for sure. What do you mean? So just because your house is made of concrete doesn't mean that you're not going to get, you know, flooding when you get 20 plus. But yeah, house is not 40 watertight. plus inches of There's rain. There's so doors so and windows. Yeah, but this idea of sleeping soundly, I don't know. Well. It's not going to fall I, down around you probably, though. I mean, no, people, but people it, build storm storm rooms inside of houses and their concrete bunkers. So he's saying, I think he's just suggesting you sleep well at night knowing your whole house is that yeah. well protected. Yeah. Uh, my, my curiosity about this kind of thing is, is around, you know, houses built to today's current, you know, thresholds in these, in specific areas, whether it's a high wind area, whether it's a flood zone, you know, certainly anything you know, we're con- constantly, you know, I, I, it feels like we're constantly seeing these stronger, more damaging storms and then building codes and building um, regional building codes reflecting, you know, whether it's, an, whether it's a, a storm like a hurricane or whether it's, a, you know, an earthquake seismic zone, um, then building codes reflecting how to do well. So what I wonder is, you know, are the 
something maybe 20, 30 years old isn't going to fare as well, of course, as something built now. But I, I would like to see something built now versus the concrete home. You know, with t- we have tie downs in, oh, yeah. you know, for, for, for stick built homes, we have, you know, putting blocking in the right places behind sheathing to protect against windborne debris. In flood zones, we have windborne, windborne debris. debris. Yes. That's up there with windblown moisture. <laughs> windborne debris. Yeah. Yeah. Airborne? Airborne. <laughs> Windblown? I would say wind because you don't see stuff floating around in still air. <laughs> windborne. So I'm going to say wind. I'm going to go with windborne. But I'm, I'm wait, with you. Wait, yeah. I got one more thing on my list. All right. Okay. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> He's back to yelling. We got him. It's passion. That's the passion. Because this is, again, something I just saw in this house in, in Colorado is yeah. the way the basements are designed now to let, to allow them to flood yeah. in a safe way. Yeah, yeah. This house was in a flood zone. Um and although the homeowner says that, that it's an antiquated flood zone, that this, this area isn't actually prone to floods anymore, but it's still considered a flood zone. And so their basement is designed in a way to let the water in, to keep it in the basement. How does that work? It, you better it, have some they, details they for have, me, Brian. They have inlets and outlets. Yeah. Oh, I've seen those. We, yeah. had, we had them as an advertiser in the magazine, that smart vent or whatever they call uh, okay, them. Okay, yeah. Um, I might have my dent. That's probably not the name. Yeah, so in the basement, what what... <laughs> Where yeah. where you would where you would expect to see like a basement window, so just above yeah. grade in the basement, mm-hmm. there's this other thing there, yeah. this other rectangular thing, and it's a way to let the water come in, so that so that the the basement floods contains the water, keeps it as long as it needs to, but it doesn't get up into the first floor oh, and it look moves at that. out. It's called smart vent. <laughs> you nice. laughed at me, Rob. <laughs> I always laugh at you, um, but I'm with you because I think and. We should dig this article up because didn't Chuck Miller after Hurricane Andrew yes. go down to Florida and figure out, try to figure out yeah. what happened? And I think one of the takeaways was, <laughs> well, I mean, why there was such <laughs> catastrophic damage. It does and sound I th- like what we would do. And I think, Chuck, go down to Florida and see if you can figure out what happened. <laughs> <laughs> but I think one of the big takeaways was like, yeah, there's no hurricane ties on the roof. Yeah. That, that was it. Yeah, houses with stapled roof sheathing yeah. didn't fare well as houses where that the roof was sheathing was the whole, nailed down. I mean, the whole was, nail thing changed after yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. There but was also, a big learning after that storm. There's, a, sure. there's some sort of simple things. There's also uh, um, in-swing versus out-swing front doors became a huge thing mm-hmm. because uh, the key to in those – what's going on with the hurricanes is I, – I guess it's probably the same as tornadoes too is if the house depressurizes, that's when all hell breaks loose. So if your front door yeah. – blows in your house has a chance to depressurize and it can essentially like things just start ripping off so people have started to switch to outswing doors oh, he's uh, pressurizing right so that it would be wait a minute do i have it backwards i think pressurizing so you no, blow outswing, the, blow the outswing roof off. doors so it, so oh. that so that it, the negative pressure inside the door stays shut and so it doesn't you don't want you, you want it to stay that way so that it doesn't. Am I saying it right? I don't know, but okay. I think uh, there's pressure happening. <laughs> yeah, we've got some pressure differentials. Yeah, um, yeah. Dig up that article because I think um, that her, Hurricane Andrew out. was. Um, we learned a lot about houses. I think after that storm. Wait, I'm gonna look it up right now. Everybody hold for should ten a, minutes. Should well. a front door open in or out? Whew. Positive pressures actually push them more tightly against the door seals. Failures of windows and doors from the pressure tends to be the most frequent. If they lose in high winds, this one will push out to relieve internal pressures. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't right. It'll be most effective in a hurricane when the door is an outswing door. Well, I just thought that was interesting. They're all, those are because they present design challenges. You have to have a bigger landing because you, can't, you yep. can't stand there while you open it. Right. You need to be able to back up. You know what I'm talking about, Brian. We do. Is that your stomach? Yeah, it's almost lunchtime. Let's go. <laughs> Wrap it. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't even start questions yet. All right, let's, uh, let's, some questions. Th- let's take one. Bob Wright. <laughs> Go to the phones. <laughs> Bob writes, Brian was talking about his list of favorite things for baths in the last show. He mentioned sliding barn doors as the, quote, in thing, and they save room. Something I've been trying to research is how do they do it blocking sounds that might come out of a bath, half bath, that is on the first floor and not that far away from the kitchen. We could really use a little more floor space in that room, but my wife is worried about the sound issue. <laughs> Thoughts? Maybe you guys can ramble on this subject for a little while. Um, I'd like to just say, Sounds let's like try Bob's to, wife doesn't want to hear Bob in the bathroom let's, anymore. Let's try to keep <laughs> keep it clean. Let's try to keep this sophisticated. So I, I, I followed I followed this question up with an email to Brian and you yesterday, and my response was like, yeah, you just you just don't do that. Don't yeah. put a, a barn door on a bathroom in a public space. I mean, yeah. So. But you can air seal a barn door. Well, mm, you know, I I, I wrote this uh, <laughs> can you? this article that that um, that I was talking about 
uh, that he's that Bob's referring to, I wrote with um, an architect, um, Paul DeGroote, talked about this on the show a couple weeks ago. Old news. And, um, old news. Um, so when we worked on the story together, I, I'm just seeing more and more barn doors on bathrooms. So I wrote about a little bit about barn doors on bathrooms, sliding doors as useful for as space savers. And Paul, you know, took was taking his turn on the article, wrote, you know, something to the effect of <laughs> barn doors being a stupid idea for bathrooms, hopes he never has to design a barn door for a bathroom for exactly the, the reason Bob's talking about. You know, a barn door is held off the wall a little bit. It has to be. Um, it has to have a little bit of clearance to slide. It has to be able to clear trim, all that kind of stuff. And so there is a gap around the door. It is going to let some more sound and some more light pass <clears> through <throat> um, than, you know, a door that... Cl- that swings closed or a pocket door that closes into, into the, you know, the, the jam a little bit. Um, I challenged Paul a little bit, said that they can, in certain places, they're okay. Like I showed you guys one this morning, um, used on, uh, the hallway into a master suite. So you're already in the master suite. You've already walked through that door. Now you're in the master suite and, and there's this little hallway going towards the bedroom and the bathroom's on the left of the hallway and they use the barn door there. Sure perfect for there it looks nice mm-hmm. you're, you're that little privacy concern is is not a problem i mean i guess it depends how loud maybe bob is in the bathroom it but is. um it's not going to be such a, a privacy get, concern just get a louder fan yeah and i challenged paul i said paul i bet in the next two years you you design one and when you do i said we're going to publish your your best tips for doing it right well so this came up the other day because Rob's planning on putting one in his house, and I so I started messing with him and saying that I think it's going to be out of style, and he watched him kind of spin off onto, well, maybe I'll do a maybe I'll do a pocket door, and then he and then he kind of figured out what I was doing and went, ah, screw this, I'm going to do a slide. But I wonder if it, if you really are going to make a design mistake by putting a because after he got I finished trashing, where are you going to use it? This is after he got finished trashing it, Brian. Then he said, I'm going to put one in my house. <laughs> No. Uh, a new addition or your yeah no I, second floor? I no I was trashing the idea of using a barn door on a bathroom. Mm-hmm. Um, you're gonna do it on your bedroom, aren't you? No, I would do it into uh, the walk-in closet, which is in the master oh. bedroom. Oh, okay, that's fine. Into it's a just, closet. That's fine. It's just not gonna be in style anymore by the time you do it. Maybe not. Definitely not. <laughs> I, think I think like I think I'm I think do like, it, like anything else, you look when you look at the hardware and you look at the door styles. Mm-hmm. You know, if you go for. If you go to make a real statement with your barn door, no, I'm not it's making not a statement. Be in stock for very I'm not long. making if a statement. Keep it pretty simple. Yeah, it's it's gonna hang on. It'll it'll it'll, it'll hang. hang a little longer. I, don't I think, think it's, it's gonna, gonna be fine. This whole movement of like make everybody's house look like we're all farmers <laughs> is just not gonna last. <laughs> we talked about that, right? And Mike me or this the farmhouse is, this style. This is no different than the people living in New York City who want to hang like a black powder rifle on their wall, like they're outdoorsmen. I think you're the only one that wants to hang a black or black powder rifle well, anywhere. What about the axe? We talked about the whole best made company, the whole movement there of just selling highly expensive stuff to people who have no use uh, for fellas, it. Fellas, fellas, yeah, what, <laughs> what, what, what are we talking about here? Let me let me bring this back a little bit. Yeah. So sliding doors are awesome. They save a ton of space. They do. If a barn door is, doesn't have the privacy for you or if it's too highly stylized, use a pocket door. Use the same door you have in the rest of your house. Yeah. Use a pocket door. <laughs> Make sure your builder knows how to install the pocket door. <laughs> <laughs> Period. There you go. All, All right. right. <laughs> Lunchtime. No, we got one more. Ah, We're starving for some reason today. Deal with yeah. it, man. All right. Craig writes, good morning, gentlemen. Well, good morning, Craig. I'm a dedicated magazine sub- subscriber and podcast listener that loves the show. Well, Craig, I love you too. I want to stay and answer your question. Rob he said, Brian. He said he loves the show. He didn't say he loves you. Well, the show loves him. He might have met the show that I hosted. <laughs> he probably didn't. Mean, he probably didn't mean that. I have a cedar pergola picture attached that I put up on the side of my house five years ago. In year two, I power washed and sealed the wood with a clear deck sealant. This summer, year five, I power wash it again, but haven't sealed it yet. With no access to seal many of the end grain cuts because they butt up to another piece of wood, I'm wondering if sealing the wood could accelerate possible water damage in the following way. The end, this guy talks like an engineer. The, the end grain soaks in water from the rain, but becomes trapped in the wood because the majority of the board has the seal coating. I want this pergola to last. Am I overthinking this and should go ahead with the sealing the pergola, or should I leave the cedar, quote, naked? So, it's beautiful, oh, yeah, by I the way. I didn't look at the picture yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice. Nice little cedar pergola. It's got like a little uh, a little roof on top of the on top of the purlins. Well, that's open, too. 
I oh, mean, yeah. this perspective looks like it's just kind of oh, yeah, board sheathing, but it's actually open. Yeah. Um, what do you guys think? I think it's mm. well. So, so Brian has a point of view on finishing. Sure does. Things. Why don't you share that point of view, well, Brian? Well, it's very simple. It's the Chuck Miller point of view, right? Yeah, it's Chuck Miller's point of view. You put a, uh, you know, when you put as soon as you put a finish on something, you have now a maintenance problem. Yep. Mm-hmm. And Brian has a cedar pergola, which we put in. Yes. Last January. Yeah. What color is it? Grayed out it's, yet? It's get yeah, it's starting. Starting. And you know, different the, the horizontal surfaces and the vertical surfaces, you know, uh, weather at different, very different rates. Mm-hmm. So it's a little um, varied right now, but it's getting there. And mm-hmm. you know, I like the weather look, and it's gonna mine's gonna blend well into the house when it weathers because I have sort of a gray house. Um, but uh, you know. I know that I, I can understand the appeal of keeping cedar looking new, too, because it's beautiful, mm-hmm. right, when it's kind of fresh. I don't think that his – I don't I, I don't have a concern for what he's bringing up about the end grain taking in the water and the finish degrading. Sure, that's going to happen, but you're going to what, – what's it going to buy you? A little bit of time in between. If he got five years out of this, you if he had sealed the end grain, maybe it's going to buy you a little time when you're finished. I'm not but, sure it's the end grain thing. What's, what's going on in some of these cases is he's got like a – a piece that crosses over perpendicular to another, like uh, like the purlins there, the purlin mm-hmm. landing where, the, and those spots tend beam. to not dry out very well, and so that could be a problem. Sure. But that's going to be a problem whether you finish it or not. Yeah, yeah I don't think that's a finishing issue. So, just the, I just think if you know if 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 he said he finished that year two and year five, if he got three years out of it's a, pretty good a, a finish, and he was happy with it for those three years, that's pretty good. And if you want to keep that look, keep finishing it. Yeah, it's not a big thing. A, what do you say? A clear deck sealant. So that tells me that it probably is like something like Thompson's water seal or similar. Yeah, where it's you know low UV resistance, clear coating, and they they do need to be renewed. Yeah, because uh, it's basically a water repellent if that's what he's using. Yeah, and yeah, I, I would probably if it was me, I would steer clear. I would either. Go down the road of I'm going to treat this in like a boat and I'm going to varnish it and treat it with a lot of care, mm. which is a film forming fin- finish. Yeah, which or is I'm be going to go with a penetrating finish that I don't need to worry about. More like an oil finish. Yeah, like, it'll be less likely yeah. to to yeah. hold water in. Yeah, yeah. And and would, it's, it's very easy to refinish. Very easy but, to refinish. But w- what about finishing over something like Thompson's water shield? You know anything about that? I don't. I don't either. I don't. Because well, isn't, isn't it have a wax? Isn't it a he doesn't have a wax component to it. Stuff like Thompson's. Um, sure. You can certainly try. You can, if you're going to do it, try a in test any, any an conspicuous area. spot. Uh, there's a series of tests you can do. Well, if he if he knows what he put on, he can do a little bit of research. He can call some companies and find out yeah. whether it's going to be an issue. But for people who don't know what their finish is, sometimes this is an issue where they have to figure out what the finish they have is now, so that they can then determine yeah. what goes over it. And there's a series of um, I'll also put a link to this. I think Peter Gedry's wrote it. Uh, yeah, I remember it this. It was uh, like a series, a certain s- sequence of trying solvents on a finish to see what it reacts to. Yeah. Like if if it gums up from this or this, then you know it's this kind of finish. Oh, that's if it right. resists this or this, then, that's you, right. then you narrow it down to this other kind of finish. It's that kind of a thing, which is a useful sequence, but I can never remember it. It's too complex but would you recommend on outdoor structures like this to avoid film finishes that's where i was going uh that's my personal preference is it because a when it does start to fall apart you need to remove it mechanically in order to get down to fresh wood again also i find that uh you get like these little black speck kind of things underneath the film finish a lot uh like little they look like little mildew spots almost Mm. and is it, you guys remember what I'm talking about? You sometimes see it on old, lack, old varnished stuff, mm-hmm. like a front door or a boat even. Um, and I don't really like that look. It looks a little plasticky. Yeah, I like the penetrating. Yeah. Yeah. It just creates, I mean, no matter what finish you apply to it, you're going to create a maintenance issue. But if it's a film finish, you have a, a lot of work ahead of you when it comes to refinishing. Yeah. yeah. Stripping, and sanding. You have a, and if you, and you have an un... Like if you use a penetrating finish and then at some point you just decide to let it weather... You, that'll happen in a in a nice natural yeah. looking way. Right. And if you have a film finish and decide to just let it weather, it gets gnarly for a while. For sure. Probably the the safest bet would be a hundred percent tongue oil, like pure tongue oil. Um, just be careful if you're going to buy tongue oil that you. A, a lot of things are called tongue oil. That they play people play fast and lose with that name. So you want to know how much varnish it has in it because a lot of tongue oil is sold as tongue oil, but it has varnish. So 
And the what the idea there is that it kind of soaks in and hardens a like little water bit. Locks? Is that water an locks is, is what technically a wiping varnish. Yeah. yeah. Uh, water locks, uh, Minwax antique oil finish. Um, Watco. Oh, I like that finish. Yeah, Watco. Watco. I haven't been able to find that anymore. Is Watco the, the Danish? One? Yeah, I like that a lot too. Yeah. The red can. Yeah. That it's, stuff is awesome. Yeah. Is Watco the Danish oil or they have tongue oil? I think it's the Danish oil. oil. Yeah. I think, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, that that's a, a mixture as well. Uh, nothing wrong with that. It's just, right. it's going to be a little bit harder, which may be a good thing. Uh, all right. That's going to wrap us up. Um, if you have questions you'd like to hear us talk about in the next show, Shoot us a note, fhbpodcast at taunton.com. Also, if you like the show, help us out with a review on iTunes or give us a little thumbs up on that YouTube video. Spread the word. We need more people in our audience. We like to reach a wider audience, and we want more contributors and a bigger family to to, to include in this show. So uh, help us out. Also, we got to try and get Martin back in here soon. Yeah, I think he's coming down for a visit, Martin Holiday. Um, we got to we got to do another visit with him to talk about all things building science. That was fun. And just a reminder, we're going to be at the remodeling show. Yes, I do not remember the, the date of that. October twenty sixth and October twenty seventh, and we'll be in Nashville, Tennessee. Rob yeah. and I will be down there. We'll have some ambassadors down there. Live uh, podcast? Is that happening? <laughs> we're yeah, going to be gonna... doing some podcasts. Sweet. We've got an event. We're going to be serving beer. Yeah. I'll repeat that. We'll be serving some beer. Come for the podcast. <laughs> stay for the beer. It's two o'clock on the twenty sixth is our event. Come for the beer. Stay for the podcast. That's right. Yeah. Rob will be giving out free hugs as well. Uh, (laughs) So, until next time, this is Justin for Rob Bryant saying, keep craft alive and happy building.